says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I am J. Harold Smith, speaker for the Radio Bible Hour located in Newport, Tennessee. And we're delighted to be able to come out there into your church or into your home and present to you this message, a message that was preached here at the First Baptist Church of Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, where Dr. William Cope is the pastor. We're indebted to this church and to this dear pastor for the use of their equipment and being able to present to you there in your church or in your home this message on the theme, Asleep in the Devil's Crib. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. But at the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Now, I want you to go back and look at verses 6 and 7. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken, are drunken in the night. Now, turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 13 and verse 11. And here in this portion of the scripture we read, and that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. And then over in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 14, these words, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. In reading this portion of the word of God that I've just read, I'm going to use for our theme tonight, a subject that I know that you have never heard used by a preacher unless some preacher stole my sermon. I'm using for our theme tonight, Asleep in the Devil's Crib. Asleep in the Devil's Crib. I believe that if you were to ask me what I consider to be the major sin and the major difficulty and the major tragedy in our Baptist churches today, I believe that immediately I would respond, it's the fact that the devil has put so many of us asleep in his crib. It makes no difference where I travel, and the Lord has allowed me to preach in all 50 of our beloved United States of America. God has allowed me to preach in 59 foreign countries. And wherever I go, if it's Asia, or Africa, or Alabama, or Arkansas, or Alaska, or Arizona, it makes no difference where I go to preach, I find the same terrible condition existing in all of our churches. So many of our people are sound asleep. When the devil is successful in putting us to sleep in his crib, we are not aware then of the dangers, of the disasters, of the destroyers that are looking round about us. If somebody had told me when I first began to preach, in 1932, if somebody had told me, Brother Smith, you will live long enough to see 1,500,000 sweet little babies murdered before they can breathe their first breath of fresh air, murdered while they're in their mother's womb, I would have not have believed it. If somebody had told me I would have lived long enough to have seen in America 15 staggering, helpless drunkards, alcoholics, on the streets and in the homes of America, I would not have believed it. If somebody had told me 57 years ago when I first began to preach that I'd live long enough to see two men 
walk down to a courthouse and apply for a marriage license, I would have never believed it. If somebody had told me I would have lived long enough to have seen two women divorce their husbands, leave their sweet family, and take up with each other as lesbians, I would have never believed it. If somebody had told me that I would live long enough in this great land of ours to have seen our streets a place of murder and slaughter and danger and where it was unsafe to walk after dark on any of the streets, any of our great cities, I would not have believed it. If somebody had told me that I'd live long enough to see our great nation, who was the head of the nations, become and fast become the tail of the nations, and though in this great wealthy rich nation become a creditor nation, I would have never believed it. We're living in a strange hour. We're living in a tragic moment. We are living in an hour when the devil has put to sleep many of God's people. As a result of it, we are not aware of his works. As aware of it, we are not aware of the devil's ways. As aware of it, we are not a, a, a asleep in the devil's crib. We are not aware of the devil's words. Asleep in the devil's crib, we are not aware of the devil's workers. Asleep in the devil's crib, we are not aware of the devil's worship. Would you ever have thought that right here in this great nation that we call America, that we had come to the hour and to the moment when there would be 50,000 witches registered in this great nation of ours. Would you ever thought that you could have gone along the street and saw a sign over a building saying, the first church of Satan? Would you ever have thought that you would have lived long enough to have seen a church pastored by an acknowledged practicing homosexual. I would have never dreamed it. I would have never thought it. But it's a reality. We are living in an hour when our people are thirsty and not aware of the spiritual drought. We are living in an hour when people are hungry and not aware of the spiritual famine. We are living in an hour when many are in a far country and they are not aware of the hogs and the hog herders that are surrounding us. We are living in an hour when the church has been put to sleep in the devil's crib. Now sleep is reminiscent of a number of Bible tragedies. For example, if you were to turn your Bibles to, Gen to Judges chapter 16 and verse 20, you'd find these words. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. Now, who is Samson? Samson perhaps is the most famous of all of the judges of Israel. Maybe there's another judge as important and as famous as he, but I am not aware of it. Samson was the most feared man by the Philistines of any man that ever lived. He was God's champion. And what about him? He went to sleep in the devil's crib. And as a result of it, three things happened. Number one, his eyes were put out. Number two, his hands were bound with fetters of brass. And number three, he had to start grinding in the Philistines' mill. It matters not who you are. Preacher, deacon, Sunday school teacher, church officer, evangelist, Bible teacher. It matters not who you are. The very moment you go to sleep in the devil's crib and he's successful in putting you to sleep, out goes your spiritual vision. Out goes your ability to perform with your hands the work of God. And immediately you begin to grind in the devil's mill. The last time I was in Cairo, Egypt, one of the guides said to me, Preacher, we have something here in the museum that we did not have the last time you were here. And he carried me around several corridors and he brought me finally to a podium about the size of this desk. There was a fiberglass cover over the top of that little desk. And in there and under that cover 
was a little instrument about that long. It looked exactly like a teaspoon, only the handle was about twice as long as our regular teaspoons, and the little spoon part of it was cupped a little more than the regular teaspoon. And he said, do you have any idea what that is? And I said, absolutely no. No, sir, I have no idea. He said, we believe that that is the kind of instrument that the Philistines use in putting out the eyes of their victims. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, they would take this little spoon and heat it to a red hot heat and then they would bind their victims so they could not move their head either to the right or the left, up or down, and then they'd take that little red hot instrument, insert it on the outside of the eye, behind the eyeball, and pull the eye out of its socket, leaving it dangling upon the cheekbone. Can you see that awful picture? Here is God's great champion. Here is this mighty man that could take the jawbone of a donkey and slay a thousand of the enemy. Here is this mighty man called Samson, bound. And here they come with that little instrument to put out his eye. Not one, but both eyes. Then after he has been blinded, they bind him. And they put him to grinding in the Philistines' mill. Everyone has said something or another have seen an old sorghum mill where they hitch an animal, a mule or a horse, onto an arm and round and round that old mule goes to that animal grinding out the sugar cane and squeezing out the juice of that sugar cane to make sorghum or molasses. And here is God's giant. Here is God's hero bound with fetters of brass grinding in the devil's mill. The tragedy of tragedies of this day. And there isn't a person in this house that couldn't call to your memory some preacher that once had power with God, had a godly influence in his church and his community. And that man went to sleep in the devil's crib. Brother Trentham, he was bound by fetters of brass. He had to go to grinding in the devil's mill. And today, he is an outcast. And God has put him on the shelf. Tragedy of tragedies. Here in this great church, I imagine in the minds of many of you that have been members of this church for years, you remember deacons that once walked up and down these aisles. And every one of you had faith and confidence in them as a man of God. And then they went to sleep in the devil's crib. And today their influence is gone and their power is gone. And they are nothing but a street bum. We all know evangelists that rated high, and in the opinions of multitudes and millions of people, they were the greatest. And today they are stumbling in disgrace. Why? Because they went to sleep in the devil's crib. I'm reminded of another tragedy, Bible tragedy, because of sleep. In Jonah chapter 1 and verse 6, the Bible says, So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, so be, if that God will think upon us, that we perish not. Who is Jonah? Now, you may not agree with me. Pastor, you may not agree. Some of you may not agree. But I believe that Jonah was the greatest evangelist that ever lived. Greater than Billy Graham? Yes. Greater than Dwight L. Moody? Yes. Greater than Billy Sunday? Yes. Greater than Charles Finney? Yes. Greater than Charles Spurgeon? Yes. I challenge anybody to show me in church history where one evangelist went into one city the size of Nineveh, preached one sermon, and everybody from the king's palace down to the most humble little hovel out in the field repented and turned to God. But Jonah went to sleep in the devil's crib. 
God called him to go to Nineveh. Who was Jonah? Jonah was a Jew. And he said, just a minute, Lord, just a minute. You've forgotten who I am. Lord, I am a Jew. And I'm not going to go down there to Nineveh, to that, Jew, that Gentile city, and preach to those Gentile dogs. Tell you what I'm going to do, Lord. I'm going down to Joppa, and I'm going to buy me a ticket, and I'm going to go to Tarshish. Now, Nineveh is over here, and Tarshish is absolutely in the opposite direction. The very minute that God calls you to do something and you refuse to do it, I don't care whether it's to preach, I don't care whether it's to be a deacon, it matters not if it's to be a, a, a singer in the choir or an usher, whatever God calls you to do in the very minute you rebel and begin to do that opposite thing, you have gone to sleep in the devil's crib and you are in for trouble. And no sooner had he got on board that ship that he went down into the ship to his quarters and soon was sound asleep. Jonah was asleep, but God was wide awake. And the Bible declares that God sent out a wind and a storm. And the Bible declares that that little ship was in trouble. And the word says that they emptied up everything that they had on that ship but the right thing. They should have thrown the preacher overboard. Now, when a church gets a backslidden Jonah for a pastor, they're in trouble. When a church gets a backslidden Jonah on the board of deacons, they're in trouble. When they get a staff member that's a backslidden Jonah, they're in trouble. The Bible says that God let that storm rage. And finally, they came to the conclusion it was just one thing to do, and that was to throw Jonah overboard. Now, if I'm wrong, and what I'm about to say, when I get to heaven, I'll apologize. Is that fair enough? Now, if you folks don't make it, you'll never know whether I was right or wrong. But I believe this with all of my heart. I don't believe that old Jonah got wet. I believe that when they threw him overboard, and those men rushed up to the side of that ship to see what was going to happen, as he struggled in dying, the biggest fish that they had ever seen in all of their life came up, opened his mouth, and old Jonah just went right straight in, head first. You say, why do you believe he went in head first, preacher? Because he came out running. I mean, he came out of that fish's stomach running. And for three days and three nights, in the belly of that fish, down in the bottom of the ocean, he paid for going to sleep in the devil's crib. You go to sleep in the devil's crib and... God may not prepare a fish for you, but he'll put you in such a terrible F-I-X fix until when you get through, going through that experience, you're going to wish you'd have never gone to sleep in the devil's crib. You go to sleep in the devil's crib and God will put you at the bottom of the ocean. You go to sleep in the devil's crib and God will put you in the bottom of a belly's fish, I mean, a fish's belly. You go to sleep in the devil's crib and God will get you in more trouble than you can ever get out, ever. I imagine that old fish that night slipped up by the side of his wife down in the bottom of the ocean and said, honey, I was following a ship today coming out of Joppa and they threw something overboard and I swallowed the whole thing. I'm miserable. Now, if I'm wrong, preacher, when I get to heaven, I'll apologize to you. Now, if you don't ever make it, you'll never know whether I was right or wrong. But I do believe with all of my heart that that old fish took every kind of a seaweed that grandpa and great-grandpa fish ever told him would make a fish regurgitate. Now, if you don't know what regurgitate means, that means up, Chuck. And I believe that he swallowed every kind of a seaweed and everything that he ever knew that would make a fish up chuck and nothing worked. But after three days and three nights, God relieved the fish and set Jonah free. And when he came out of that fish, he came out smelling fishy, but on his way to Nineveh. And let me tell you something, when God gets through riding you in his fish, 
you'll go anywhere, any place, any time God wants you to go. God forbid that we should ever get a ticket to, to Tarshish when God wants us to go to Nineveh. Number three, tragedy. The Bible declares here in Judges chapter 4 and verse 21, then Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent and took a hammer in her hand and went softly unto him and smote the nail into his temples and fastened it in the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary. So he died. Who was Sisera? Sisera, you remember, was the captain of Jabin's army. According to Judges chapter 4 and verse 7. Who was King Jabin? The Bible says he was a king of Canaan. And every year, for 20 years, Sisera had come down to Israel and had ravished and raped Israel, going away with all of the beautiful lace work, going away with all of the grain that Israel had been profited with for that year, leaving them stripped. And so this year, we find Sisera coming down with 900 chariots of iron. Can you imagine in your imagination that tremendous army coming down against little helpless Israel? Not a one of them had a bow and arrow. Not a one of them had a spear. Not a one of them had a sword. They had to go down into their enemy's country to get their hoes and their axes sharpened. And here comes that invading army. Israel stood helpless. But the Bible says, God let the stars in their courses fight against Sisera. And the rain began to come. And the thunder and the lightning. And those great iron chariots began to bog up in the mire. And those beautiful trained horses were no longer able to pull those chariots. And finally, this most beautiful of all of the 900 chariots, the one in which Sisera rode, the one that had all of the insignias of victory pitted on the side of him, bogged down. And Sisera looked back and saw those, that angry mob of Jews coming after him. And he jumped out of that chariot and began to run across the plain. And away yonder in the distance, he saw a little speck that he recognized as a tent in the desert. And he hastened toward that little tent. Now in those days, if a woman permitted a man to come into her tent while her husband was away, or if a woman permitted her husband to come into her apartment or into their home while her husband was not pre present, she was put to death because they said she would have never allowed him to come in unless she had committed adultery with that man. And so under the death sentence, standing in the door of that tent was Jael, Heber's wife. Who was Heber? Heber was a relative of the father-in-law of Moses. And here stood this beautiful woman in the door of that tent. And I see Sisera, tired and exhausted, running across that plain. He gets near enough to where she can hear him, and he said, Ma'am, ma'am, would you please, ma'am, give me a drink of water? I am so thirsty, ma'am. And she says, Come right into my tent, sir. And she invites him into her tent, and the Bible says she served him milk and butter on a lordly dish. And after he had had his fill of drink, and after he had quenched his hunger, he said, may I stretch out on the floor of your tent and just take a little nap? She said, just help yourself. And she spread for him maybe a sheepskin. And he stretched out on it, and in a moment that weary captain was sound asleep. Noting that he was sound asleep, she slipped out of that little tent, went out to the tent, took that little hammer that she used to drive in the stakes that held the tent in place, pulled up one of those little stakes, and then slipped 
softly back into where he was asleep, asleep on, the, on the floor of our tent, placed that little peg, that little tent peg there on his temple, and then lifted that hammer, and with one blow, she drove that peg all the way through his skull and his brain and wedged him into the earth. And so he died. Go to sleep in the devil's crib and he'll put a peg through your spiritual brain and join you and wedge you to the affairs of this world. It's dangerous to go to sleep in the devil's crib. It was while the disciples slept that the enemy came and took Jesus, binding him and leading him away to trial and death. It was while the church slept that the enemy came in among the wheat and sowed the tares. And if ever there has been an hour when we need to wake up, I believe it's in this hour. Sleep, I tell you, is a time of inactivity. Is there anybody in this house that went to sleep last night by 10 o'clock and didn't wake up till 6 o'clock this morning or after? Is there anybody that went to sleep at 11 o'clock and didn't wake up till 5 o'clock this morning? You slept all the way through those seven hours. Anybody here that slept, is there anybody in this house that slept seven hours last night without waking up? Raise your hand. Boy, this is a restless crowd. There's one brother that's got a clear conscience. Uh, yes, sir. Well, brother, if I were to call you to this platform and ask you to tell what happened during that time, you would not be able to tell us. It's a time of inactivity. It's a time of absolute inactivity. Now, now, how many of you ever heard of anybody walking in their sleep? Do people walk in their sleep up here in this county? How many of you ever heard of anybody walking in their sleep? Raise your hand. Oh, yeah, lots of us. While I was pastor in Fort Smith, Arkansas, I had a lovely young couple that I performed their wedding ceremony about six months before they heard me preach one Sunday night on the rapture. And I said in my message that night, I said, some day, maybe day or night, the trumpet of the Lord is going to sound. The dead in Christ are going to be raised. And all of us that are alive and all of us that know Jesus Christ and have been washed in the blood are going to be caught up in a moment in the twinkle of an eye to be with the Lord. I said, the rest of you are going to be left. I said, what a tragedy when some of you wives wake up and your godly husband is gone. What a tragedy it's going to be when some of you husbands wake up and your godly wife is going to be gone. What a tragedy when you parents wake up and your sweet little babies have been caught up. And Grace and Bill heard that sermon that night. And about two o'clock in the morning, Grace woke up, fell over on the side of the bed. Her husband wasn't there. She snapped on the light, went to the restroom. He wasn't there. She went out in the kitchen, the little breakfast room, kitchen, wasn't there. The back door was locked. She came back through the bedroom and out through the den. He wasn't there. Went into the dining room and the living room, and he wasn't there. And the front door was locked. And she screamed, it's happened. The rapture has come and I'm left. And her screaming woke Bill up. He crawled out from behind the settee. He got up in his sleep, walked into the living room and crawled in behind the settee and the wall. She said, preacher, I'd have killed him right there on the spot, but I was so glad the rapture hadn't taken place. My dad, when he and my mother married, perhaps was one of the most fanatical Masons that's ever lived. Now, dad had missed church, but he would miss that Masonic Lodge. I tell you, he might not give to the church, but he paid his Masonic dues. And my mother and dad had been married about three or four months. Dad came in one night from the Masonic Lodge about 11.30. Tired and weary, he was soon asleep. But coming in, he woke my mother up. And soon dad was asleep. And shortly after he went to sleep, while my mother was lying there wide awake, he said, do you know what the password is? And my mother grabbed him by the arm 
and said, no, Charles, what is it? And woke him up and never found out. <laughs> We've all heard of people walking and talking their sleep. But in all of my years, I never have heard of anybody working in their sleep. Pastor, do you have anybody in this church that's a talker and a walker? But if when it comes down to work, they excuse themselves. If the piano is to be moved, they grab the stool. They're not going to get a hernia. They're not going to get a back injury. They're not going to strain themselves to do anything for God. Why? Because they are asleep in the devil's crib. I believe if ever there has been an hour when we need to wake up, it's now. Sleep is not only a time of inactivity, but it's a time of unconsciousness. Asleep in the devil's crib, we are not aware of God's purpose. We are not aware of God's plan. We are not aware of God's program. We are not aware of God's power. We're not aware of God's peace. We're not aware of God's provision. We're not aware of God's punishment. If ever there has been a time when we need to be awakened, alerted, and alarmed, it's in this hour. Now you say, Brother Smith, why should we stay awake? I want to give you four reasons, very briefly. You say, Preacher, why should we stay awake? First of all, we should stay awake because we are the salt of the earth. The Bible declares in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13, Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, where we shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Our church is loaded down with good for nothing members. People that have lost their salt. We should stay awake because we are the salt of the earth. Number two. We should say, awake because we are the guardians of the truth and of freedom. John 8, 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And then we should stay awake in the third place because we are the ambassadors for Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you. By us we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. And then we should stay awake because we are his judges. How many of you ever heard anybody say, say, judge not that you be not judged? How many of you ever heard that? Well, you know who the Lord said that to? He didn't say that to his saints. He didn't say that to his servants. He said that to the hypocrites. Here's what he says to the people of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2. Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? No civil case between two godly people should ever be tried in a court, a civil court. They should be brought to the altar in the church. And the church should make the decision. And then I tell you, we should stay awake because of the plight and the peril of our lost loved ones. If that door were to suddenly open and a police officer or a fireman would step in and say, Mr. Smith, I hate to interrupt this service, but there's a fire in our community and the neighbors say that the people that live here are at the church tonight and he'd call your name. I wouldn't have to say, is Mr. and Mrs. Earl Jones present? If that fireman called your name, brother, I tell you, before you, got th before you got through with the last syllable, you'd be up and out of that aisle and out there to your car. And you'd do your dead level best to make it back to your house as quickly as possible. Especially if you had a little poodle dog in that house. But what if you left home tonight with three or four of your children or grandchildren there? Those, that would be the most agonizing mile or two that you'd ever drive in your life, getting to your house. You could see the red glow of that fire. And every, every yard that you got closer, the danger of your precious loved ones lurked more and more in your heart. But we sit down and have breakfast 
and lunch and dinner with a husband that's lost. We never shed a tear. We never become anxious. We never make a request for his salvation. We go to bed at night and our children are lost and on their way to hell. And we can go to bed without even reading the Bible and getting on our knees and praying and saying, God, save my lost son, my lost daughter. We have grandchildren that are on their way to hell. And where is the grandpa and the grandma that's weeping or the erring ones? Our tears have been dried up because we are sound asleep in the devil's crib. And we ought to stay awake because of the peril and the plight of that lost loved one. If they were saved and burned up in your home, that would not be the tragedy of living in luxury and dying in their sins and going to hell. Never will I forget the sweet mother whose son I had begged and begged to give his heart to Christ. He was my next door neighbor. And I begged that teenage boy to give his heart to Christ. But one night, coming back from a date on what is called dead man's curve, he didn't navigate that curve and had an accident. They called me to come to the hospital and when I got there, he was dying. And to hear that pitiful mother cry out, my boy, my boy is going to hell. But she never showed that interest until he got on his dying bed. Let me tell you, to weep down here in this morgue or to come to this church and have that body of your loved one roll down at this altar and then weep over them is sheer hypocrisy. Now is the time to wake up and become concerned over our lost loved ones. Do you agree? And then we ought to stay awake because we are going to have to give an account to God. We're going to have to face the great auditor. The Bible says in Romans chapter 14 and verse 12, so that every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. A few days ago, a banker, the head of a savings and loan company, had the bank examiners to come into his office and they said, we want to look at the books. And they started. And about 10.30, he went into the bathroom of that great institution, took out a gun, put it in the top of his mouth and blew out the top of his head. And when the auditors got through auditing the books, they found that he had gambled in Las Vegas over $2 million of the funds of that savings and loan. He couldn't face the accountant. One of these days, choir, you're going to stand and not give an account to your pastor. One of these days, you're not going to give an account to some judge, but to the great auditor of the sky. And he's going to look at what you had and what you could have had and what you could have been and what you actually are. And then I tell you, he's going to judge you. And when he gets through, you will stand speechless. And if all of your works have been made out of wood, hay, stubble, they will be burned. They will be destroyed. But if they have been made out of gold and silver and precious stones, they will abide the judgment, the investigation of the head auditor of the sky, God Almighty. So because we're going to have to face the auditor of the sky, we ought to stay awake. And I tell you, we ought to stay awake because hell's fire is not a myth. Hell is real. And ever, if there has ever been a time when we need to stay awake, and snatch those that are staggering right on the very brink of hell. Pull them back and rescue them. We used to sing in our churches, rescue the perishing. 
care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. But that got to eating on our conscience so bad until we don't sing it anymore. Many of our songbooks have left it out. They don't want that song in there. Rescue the perishing. And then I tell you we should stay awake because our lives are going to soon end. I know that according to the laws of nature, I cannot have many more years. That's one of the reasons that we are taping these messages in this revival meeting so that we can reproduce them and send them out to many little churches all over America so that they can have a revival on Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. And I want you to pray that God will use these messages not only to bless us here in this church, but wherever these messages shall go around the world, pray that God will use them. And maybe after I'm gone, God can use them. And then I tell you, we should stay awake because our day of opportunity is passing. And what days we have left, we ought to be about our Father's business. Then last of all, we should stay awake because of the soon coming of our wonderful Lord. Acts chapter 1 and verse 11, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. That promise has not yet been fulfilled, but the nearness of it may be closer than any of us imagine. Do you talk about prayer but never pray? Do you believe in the Bible but never read it? Do you lay out a Sunday school and church services and still sing, Oh, how I love Jesus? Do you believe in heavenly rewards and do nothing, absolutely nothing to gain one? Do you say eternity is more important than time, but live only for the present? Had you rather hear something good or something bad about some individual? Had you rather lie than to tell the truth? Do you criticize others for something that you do? Do you live like hell, but expect to go to heaven? It amazes me when I think about preachers that will stand up and preach against adultery and all the time paying off by bribery some woman not to tell of that person's committing adultery with that individual. I'm amazed to hear a preacher stand on television and condemn pornography and yet all the time he's doing it, he's visiting a prostitute, having her to undress before him and perform acts that are so repulsive until it makes just the decent citizen, not only the Christian, but the decent Christian, sick to their stomach. I want to tell you we are living in an hour when the devil has successfully put to sleep God's church. Do you agree? The great sin of our church is not adultery. It's not fornication. It's not drug abuse. It's not alcohol. It's not lying. But the greatest tragedy of our churches today is to see the absolute indifference of the vast majority of our members. They could care less whether the budget is met. They could care less whether there's a growth in Sunday school. They could care less, but I tell you, whether there's people saved at the altar. They could care less, but I tell you, whether they reach the lost in their city. Why? 
because they're asleep in the devil's crib. Do you agree? We hope that this video presentation has been a blessing to you. Dr. Smith now has a special message to those of you watching at home. Here again is Dr. Smith. Now you that are watching in your home, right there in the privacy of your household, right there by your TV set, you have heard this message on a sleep in the devil's crib. Have you permitted the devil to put you to sleep in the devil's crib? Are you like Samson, Jonah, Sisera? Do you want all of the tragedies that fell upon them to fall upon you and upon your household? Do you see the tremendous sin of falling asleep in the devil's crib? Have I made it plain to you that God is willing to forgive you and forget that you ever went to sleep in the devil's crib? If I haven't made it plain to you, I want now to emphasize, dogmatically emphasize, that God will forgive you if you have fallen asleep in his crib, if you'll just simply ask him. Will you do it right there with your family or right there alone? Will you just bow your head and say, God, this preacher has told the truth. I have indeed fallen asleep in the devil's crib, but by your grace, I'm getting out, and never again will I be guilty of falling asleep in the devil's crib. And thank you. If you would like to know more about this work, go to the web address on your screen. This is Don Smith, and again, I want to thank you for watching this video today. And may the Lord bless you in every area of your life.